Hello, and welcome to another week. Although, remember, the work week is a fiction. Monday, doubly so. You can get rid of them if you really want to. This is Social Justice Alchemy. So one of the first things you're going to notice this week is that Jonathan and Julie are not here. I overslept like a madman, totally messed up recording slot. I blame it on going to see Captain Marvel last night. The movie theater was a little loud. I ended up getting a migraine today, so I'm saying I was in prodrome. That is my excuse. You can't prove I'm lying. All right, I'm going to talk about some of our labels and what the political parties are. What are the Democrats? What are the Republicans? What are liberal, progressive, conservative, right? What do these things mean? The way liberal and conservative are used in the U.S. is basically synonymous with just Republican and Democrat. But that's not all that useful. If you're just going to use those as synonyms for the names of the tribes, then they don't tell you anything about the tribes. So what are they really? Well, going back to my high school AP U.S. government class, Liberal means people who want change, and conservative means people who don't want change. And those are pretty good definitions. You know, they work well in the American context. They ignore the historical meaning of the word liberal, though. I really strongly recommend the YouTube series by, you know, Philosophy Tube. It is great. It, uh, he has a series of videos, a great series of videos, on the history of liberalism. It's a political and economic philosophy developed in the 17th and 18th centuries in order to bolster the new economic model of capitalism. It sought to atomize society, remove all the old social structures that were standing in the way of increasing the wealth and power of a small elite. So instead of calling the Democrats liberal, let's go ahead and call that movement progressive. No, the people who want progress, people who want to make change for the sake of improving society. They're progressives. But obviously not all Democrats are progressive. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, she proposed her Green New Deal, and Nancy Pelosi said, how are we going to pay for it? And she was pissing all over it, but throwing a wet blanket on it. She was not helping. So there is a wing of the Democrats, you know, AOC, Bernie Sanders, similar, who do want social progress. They are progressive, but there's obviously a wing of the Democrats that are not. They are conservative. So we'll call it the Clinton conservatives on the one hand, and, I don't know, Bernie and Cortez progressives on the other. What about the Republicans? Well, obviously they are totally in favor of big business. Let big business do whatever the hell it wants. That doesn't really align itself with a conservative philosophy. Not even a little bit. They are constantly trying to make change away from historical norms. Remember, our historical norms were high taxes, very high taxes. So, the big business wing is not conservative. They are not trying to prevent change. You also have what we call social conservatives. You might say that they are trying to prevent change. They're trying to prevent the advance of social progress. They're trying to stand in the way of gay marriage, trans rights, civil rights for black people. But that's not all they're doing. They're also trying to roll those things back. They are trying to, and are largely succeeding in, eliminating the progress we've made, not just in the last 50 years in the case of abortion rights, but in the last 150 years in the case of black rights. Remember... The Supreme Court, not that long ago, ruled that, yeah, we don't really need that whole Civil Rights Act thing anymore. We don't need protection for brown people's voting rights, despite the fact that we demonstrably do. So in a way, they're not conservative. They're regressive. They are trying to roll back changes we've already made. But they're actually even worse than that. Because they keep on talking about wanting to go back to the past, while ignoring what the past actually was. They want to return to their idealized notion of the past. 
they want to go back to a fiction. So they are again trying to create change in a new direction. When you combine that with their over-the-top religiosity, with their rampant bigotries, with their militarism, all of this spells one thing. Fascism. There is a corporate wing of the Republican Party that only cares about ensuring the profits of the wealthy. That's the Koch brothers wing. And you also have the fascist wing. Those are the people we call the social conservatives. But they're not conservative. Conservatives just want to ride the brakes. Fascists want to make changes, and they want to make changes in a horrible direction. Those are the two parties we're looking at. Those are the wings of the parties. We have progressive Democrats and conservative Democrats. And we have extreme ultra-capitalist Republicans on the one hand, and extreme fascist Republicans on the other. And nobody should be really excessively surprised that the fascist and capitalist Republicans are getting along so well. Fascism and capitalism have always been able to cooperate. They're not necessarily completely entwined. At least I don't think so. There are those who argue that they are. But they do cooperate very, very well. Fascism is an authoritarian, hierarchical belief system. And it also views the structure of society as being mandated from on high by God, or possibly just, you know, the universe. In the case of, say, older Chinese fascists, the imperialists. And thus, people who have power deserve that power, unless they are obviously unworthy, you know, like... Warren Buffett, or Jews. So the fact that capitalism doesn't just encourage, but requires the accumulation of wealth and power into fewer and fewer hands, creating a very, very stark hierarchy, allows it to mesh very well with the incredibly hierarchical thinking of the fascists. But how did we get here? This is something a lot of people aren't familiar with, but it's something that's becoming more and more uh, well-known as we proceed, because people are becoming more uh, familiar with the Southern Strategy. But the Southern Strategy was a response to the split in the Democratic Party, which was itself a kind of inevitable response to the coalition created by FDR which was a response to Republican policies, which were basically what the Republican policies had been since the Civil War. So let's go ahead and go back to the Civil War. First things first, the Civil War was about slavery. Absolutely, utterly, entirely nothing else. Anyone who says otherwise is either ignorant or lying. All the things that the southern states were talking about, states' rights, sovereignty, shit like that, that was all a smokescreen. Fascists always lie. It's always about power, and they will say whatever bullshit they need to to get the conservatives to go along with it. Or the traditional liberals. Liberal democracy has a tendency to slide into fascism because the fascists can so easily abuse liberal ideologies in liberal social structures. That's a whole thing. In any event, the Civil War was the, uh, let's see, Texas, Cuba, Cuba, Kansas, the fifth time the U.S. went to war over slavery, or went to war because of slavery. There had been national parties prior to the Civil War, the Whigs and the Democrats. Truly national. They were spread across the entire nation, and they weren't really ideological in the way we understand parties today. However, the issue of slavery tore the parties apart. You ended up with uh, Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats, Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs. In fact, the issue of slavery in the lead-up to the Civil War destroyed the Whigs. That's where the Republican Party came from. Following the basically complete destruction of the Whigs. You know, the Republican Party sort of built itself up 
you know, as a coalition of a bunch of third parties and issue groups that included abolitionists. But they weren't the abolitionist party. They tried to strike a middle ground, you know, saying that they wanted to prevent the spread of slavery, but they didn't favor abolition. They were hoping to keep the Union together, basically, and they were fighting with the fascists for the conservative vote. In any event, it didn't convince the fascists. Uh, Lincoln won the election, and the counter-revolution began before the revolution could get off the ground. The fascists seceded from the Union. The war happened, and we were left with two parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. The Democrats had two wings. The fascists, who were in complete control of the South following the failure of Reconstruction, and conservatives, who were the Democratic presence outside the South. They were a very rural party. The conservatives in the North were willing to ally with the fascists in the South because Southern fascism kept the South incredibly rural, so their economic interests aligned. Meanwhile, the Republicans were the urban party. Their two wings were the wealthy elites and the workers, the factory owners, the factory workers. They didn't always have the same economic interests, but the Republican Party, from the beginning, being that urban party, always pitched the lie of trickle-down economics. They didn't call it that, but you can find Democrats railing against the bullshit notion of trickle-down economics going back well over a century. William Jennings Bryan, racist, had a speech around the turn of the 20th century, just calling it bullshit. Oh, although in very fancy terms. In any event, because the Democrats were incredibly racist and hateful and fascist, and the fascists were, as always, unwilling to compromise, the Democrats, the party, didn't have much power. The Republicans dominated national politics from their beginnings until the Great Depression. The reason for that, of course, is that the Great Depression was obviously the result of Republican economic policies. Let the rich do whatever they want, and the result inevitably is complete economic meltdown. The poor get fucked. So in comes FDR. FDR was a Northern Democrat who brought in his New Deal. But he couldn't do it with the Democrats alone. He needed more. So he had a coalition. That coalition consisted of Southern fascists, Democrats, Northern conservatives, Democrats, and the working poor. Some of the people who had been hurt worst by the Depression. Keep in mind that farmers had also been fucked by the Depression. So, the coalition FDR built was people who had been hurt by the Depression. And it worked. His New Deal started basically pulling the U.S. out of the Depression. You can actually see charts (laughs) showing, you know, GDP rising, 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 rising. There's a Republican backlash. They win Congress, end the New Deal, followed by an immediate recession. They lose the House two years later, and they start climbing again. It worked. FDR was basically a social Democrat. Then comes Truman. This is after World War II. Truman was basically the first of the modern Democrats, a social progressive. He took a look at the horrors of World War II and the Nazi Holocaust, and he thought perhaps the U.S. would be finally, finally willing to stop being quite so horrible to brown people. He was wrong. He tried to pass civil rights legislation in 1947. That legislation was filibustered by a member of his own party, Senator Strom Thurmond, racist. So, having successfully torpedoed Truman's civil rights legislation, took the southern fascist Democrats, broke off, and formed a new party, the Dixiecrats. Complete control of the South, no votes outside of it. Now, third parties are strange in U.S. politics. I mean, they show up, but they aren't normally successful. They make a splash, and either they become popular enough that their policies get implemented by one of the major parties, or one of the major parties disappears and one of the third parties rises up to take their place, almost by accident. This is a result of just the math of U.S. politics. 
You know, we have a first-past-the-post system, all or nothing. You get 50% of the votes and one more, and you win. Anything less than that, and you lose everything. Therefore, just by the math, just by the money, you're always going to have two parties fighting over that last vote. So the Dixiecrats are strange because they should have disappeared, but they didn't. So the Dixiecrats are strange because a third party normally either disappears rapidly or replaces one of the major parties, and the Dixiecrats didn't either. They stuck around for decades. And that's because they were fascist. Where they had control, they had complete control, so they couldn't be eliminated. But, because they were uniformly, completely, and utterly awful, they couldn't gain any ground. Another development in the post-war years was the development of the middle class, the suburbs. So the Republicans, post-war, having lost most of their uh, working base and continuing to hemorrhage workers to the Democrats, not the Dixiecrats, but the Democrats, were reliant, more or less, on their wealthy elite and suburban whites. Republicans in the post-war years were divided, as always, into two wings. Those being called Rockefeller Republicans and Goldwater Republicans. Rockefeller was a liberal governor of New York, a modern progressive. Goldwater was a piece of shit from Arizona, a senator. Over the years, as they lost more and more working poor to the Democrats, and the Democrats became more and more progressive... They still had their conservative wing, but they also had more and more progressives. The Republicans lost more and more of their Rockefeller Republicans to the Democrats. And that's what allowed the Democrats to finally pass their civil rights legislation in 1964. That definitely, absolutely meant that the Dixiecrats would never go back to the Democrats. It was an unforgivable betrayal of their fascist, racist bullshit. But... It also signaled the way forward for Republicans. Because the presidential election of 1964 was the first time a Republican won votes in the Deep South. That was Barry Goldwater. He was what we would now call a libertarian. A small government Republican. Goldwater was opposed to the Civil Rights Act. He claimed because he favored small government. Given that he was a Jew who had joined a Native American tribe out there in Arizona, that might actually be true. But the fact is that Goldwater appealed to the fascists in the South. He was infamous at the time for a television ad showing a little girl playing in a field with a mushroom clown in the background, playing on fear. He appealed very, very strongly to the fascists in the South. That was not really an accident. So who knows what lies in the hearts of men? Was Goldwater an actual racist, or was he just willing to appeal to racism? Who gives a shit? He won in the South. And that's what spelled the way forward for the Republicans. In 1968, Richard Nixon ran on the Southern strategy. Very, very simple. Two tenets to the Southern strategy. Rule one, be racist. Rule two, don't sound racist. Rule one, being racist, was necessary to win in the South. You could not win in the fascist South unless you were a hideously awful piece of shit racist motherfucker. But you also needed rule two. The fascists had never won outside the South. If you wanted to win votes outside the South, you needed to give them plausible deniability. I mean, don't get me wrong. The U.S. was incredibly racist in the 1960s, but they looked at the South and said, whoa, 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 come on. Kill your Negroes in a dark alley late at night. Don't do it live on national television. So yeah, Nixon opened the doors of the Republican Party to the KKK. He said, have fun, do what you want, just take off the hoods. And it worked. That's what created the modern Republican coalition. They had the old, you know, anarcho-capitalists, you know, the old people who think capitalism will save everyone because magic, and the fascists, the KKK. They took off the hoods, they put on suits, started calling themselves white evangelicals. <laughs> That's where the modern American system came from. Those are our two major parties. The old conservatives, who had always been Democrats, remained Democrats. Progressives left the Republican Party and became Democrats after the Dixiecrats, the fascists, left. 
The Republicans' wealthy, ultra-capitalist wing had always been part of the Republican Party, and they absorbed the Dixiecrats, the fascists, in 1968. So, if you've ever wondered why the American political system is the way it is, why it is so utterly fucked, there you go. It's because one of our parties is an absolutely determined, unhesitating, unflinching dedication to fucking over everyone who isn't a rich, straight, white, Christian dude. They have absolutely no qualms about doing everything they can to bolster, to support the rigid 1950s stereotype hierarchy. The other party is an unhappy alliance between people who want change and people who don't want change. That's why the Democrats can't get shit done, and why they keep on getting fucked over by Republican lies. Because the Republicans are the fascist party, who have no qualms about doing whatever it takes to achieve, maintain, and steal power. talk about something a little bit different. I saw Captain Marvel last night. I liked it quite a lot, and there were some things I disliked. Alright, I'm going to not give away any spoilers here. I don't know that there are any spoilers to give away. It's a, it's, it's a very standard, formulaic sort of movie. It relies very heavily on 90s nostalgia, and it does that fairly well. As you know, some in jokes for you know the history and the movies and the histories of the comic universe and things like that. It's you know, it does a good job, hits all the right beats. You know, no surprises at all, really. Just a really good, fun movie. You know, it's, it has the humor notes, it has the pathos, it has everything you need. A couple of things I really like about it, namely girl power, a very '90s girl power. So very appropriate. That might be why they did it that way. 
But, uh, you know, Captain Marvel, you know, at her moment of realizing who she is, how awesome she is, she, uh, she does, you know, this, this thing where she stands up to the bad guy by remembering moments from her past where she failed and then stood back up. Okay, so it's just, you know, shot after shot after shot of a little girl, you know, bruised and battered, standing up and keeping on going. So that was really awesome. I also love the value they placed on uh, 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 that strong girl friendship. You know, she has her best friend who, um, you know, they just support the hell out of each other, you know, both in flashbacks and in the present. You know, women fighting for women, women giving each other emotional strength and support, the sort of thing men really, really need to do better at, right? So, I mean, just really great stuff there. On the other hand, it, it's a superhero movie. And the backstory for Captain Marvel is as a, a U.S. Air Force pilot. I mean, set in the 90s, so she wasn't allowed to fly combat missions, but still, it kind of, you know, does that glorifying the military thing. Not great. And of course, eh, I'm not a big fan of the idea of heroes. You know, it's not one person standing up and making a change. It shouldn't be. You know, our stories are full of it, but it sh it, real change doesn't happen because one person stands up and forces this huge change, and yay, there's a hero. It, it's about lots of people working together to push hard, to fight for those changes. That is where change will really happen, not because of heroes. So, you know, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I do love the superhero movies, I love the fights, I, I, I love the spectacle, but I, I kind of wish we had a story about real revolution, about uh, the, the real way we're going to make change and make the world better. It's not going to be about a woman with an awesome mohawk and a magic suit flying around with magic powers, you know, fighting bad guys. It, it's going to be about, you know, thousands or millions of people working hard every day to make the world a better place. Nevertheless, even though the movie last night gave me a migraine today, I did love it, and I do recommend you go see it. Just don't buy into the hero mythos. And don't support the U.S. military. <laughs> All right. And I think that'll do it for this week in Social Justice Alchemy. Even though they're not here, I'm going to go ahead and plug for them. Check out Jonathan's channel, Some Random Geek. You can also find him on Twitter, at Some Random Geek. He likes to do movie reviews and talk about anarchism. Uh, you can also find uh, Julie, Facebook, at The Crypt Crafter. And she's one of the moderators for the Facebook page, Anarchist Memes. So go ahead and check that one out, too. I take part in another podcast. If you're looking for something completely different, it's the Dungeons and Debacles podcast, hosted by my friend Kevin. Uh, we are playing what they call an evil party looking to unleash an ancient red dragon from her imprisonment. It's a heck of a lot of fun. Completely different. I really recommend it. I also have started uh, doing Twitch stuff, you know, for some of my video gaming, not all of it. <laughs> uh, I'm currently playing through uh, Knights of the Old Republic, the first one. You can find that uh, on Twitch at uh, Sergoshan, S-U-R-G-O-S-H-A-N. Meanwhile, Social Justice Alchemy is available as a podcast on iTunes, or you can find it on YouTube at Social Justice Alchemy. We also have a blog where you can find links and the old archive. Uh, that is found at sergoshan.blogspot.com, S-U-R-G-O-S-H-A-N.blogspot.com. Uh, Jonathan also loves uh, to help people and has a number of shout-outs every week. Uh, let's see, Lady Columbia needs a hand. Uh, there's also Safira Joe, and I'm afraid I'm blanking on the various other people who he's always helping out. But you will be able to find links for those at the blog and uh, down in the thingy on YouTube and so on. Please, please do check that out. Uh, some people are at risk for losing their homes. Um, some people need to beg to live. Uh, so it's always good to give members of the community a helping hand. Please check that out. All right. I'll see you next week. Thanks for stopping by. Mm -hmm.